So good to be um, speaking this morning. If you would please bow your heads, uh, we're going to pray. Lord, we thank you um, so much for the opportunity and privilege that it is, Lord, to look into your word and to look into your scripture. Lord, and just see you, uh, see you exalted, Lord, and just see the light that you bring uh, to those who follow you. And so, God, we pray that the words this morning wouldn't be the words of man, Lord, but uh, a broken vessel uh, would deliver um, your word, which is holy and righteous. And God, you are holy and righteous, and we're thankful for the opportunity um, and privilege that it is to be here again together. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about journeys. Um, and, and one of the journeys that sticks out like very prominently in my life is the very first journey that I took after I got my learner's permit. Yes, some of you may remember that journey in your life. Well, for me, I was like a year and a half delayed on getting my permit. Most young people get it when they're 15. I was like 16 and a half, and I was counting down the days, and so I was so excited once I finally got my learner's permit. And so the first thing that I wanted to do when I got home was what? Drive. Drive. And I, it didn't matter where, I just wanted to go. I wanted to get on the open road and just, you know, press on, step on the gas and go for it. And so my uncle, who I was living with at the time, needed to take a trip over to the hardware store. And so he said, hey, I got to go to the hardware store. You're driving. Awesome. Okay, yes. So I'm going to drive. I'm going to go to the hardware store. And I was ready to rock and roll. I was ready to rock because I was going to crank up that music. You know, I was the driver now. I was in control. I was going to crank up that music, listen to, you know, some tunes, and I was going to roll down that street, head on to the hardware store. It was going to be a very, very great trip, but there were two difficulties with my rock and roll idea. The first one, my uncle only allows AM sports radio in his truck. <laughs> And so there was no music, there was just talk, and I didn't really want to crank that up. It was more distracting than anything. And the other difficulty was I wasn't really able to roll because he had this long bed truck that I was going to drive, and it was a manual transmission. It was a stick shift, and I didn't know how to drive an automatic, much less a stick shift. And so I get into this truck, right? And, and the errors just began to mount. I mean, I couldn't even get the thing to move. And so he's showing me, you know, the clutch and the, and the, the shifter and the wheel. And I'm trying to orient everything, mirrors. It's like a whole new world, right? And so we get going down on this trip. And I was so focused on the clutch and the shifter and the mirrors and the steering wheel that I really lost sight of what was beyond the windshield. Okay, I didn't get in an accident that day, but I had close call after close call after close call. In fact, at one point, we went to a four-way stop, and this four-way stop was on a slight incline. And it took me like eight turns just to get through the stop sign. And we saw someone we knew that was driving through at one point. Like, <laughs> like, no, this is bad. This person went to my school. It was so embarrassing. It was awful. And, and here's the thing. As we got going, as I'm trying to like shift and mirrors and steering wheels and all this, I could not even hear what my uncle was saying. It was like I was just zoned out to these difficulties and these mistakes and mistake after mistake after mistake. All I could hear was, you're failing. And there were cars that I was going to hit. And it, what ended up happening was my uncle said, hey, we got down the street and he said, stop. Okay, I did hear that. It was probably more, you know, if, if you've taught uh, uh, your son or daughter to drive or you've been taught to drive, it was probably a louder stop than just stop, especially if I wasn't hearing him. But he says, stop. And I stopped and he said, look at the road. There are cars all over the side of the road. And if you don't pay attention to what's beyond the windshield, you're going to hit them. You're going to get in an accident. And so you have to pay attention to what is going on. But here's the deal. Focusing on our failures can be catastrophic without the right perspective, without what's beyond the windshield. And it's a shift in our perspective and our understanding that will get us beyond failure, 
moving forward of a better knowledge of a better way. And the Lord wants to encourage those who have begun a journey and are near destruction or have experienced destruction in their lives. And he uses many things to show people the way, including his people. He puts us on a journey as his people to show others the way, but he also has a journey in our lives to show us the way continually. And today we're gonna be looking in John chapter four, and Jesus is beginning to receive unwanted attention at this point. The Pharisees had heard that his disciples were baptizing more people than John was baptizing. And there was this opposition rising and a confrontation mounting and Jesus' time had not yet come. And so what he decides to do is he decides to head from Judea to Galilee. And there were many different ways to get to Galilee from Judea. For for Jewish people, for a good Jewish person, the common way was to at all costs avoid this place called Samaria. And so they would go around adding an extra two days to their journey in order to get around Samaria. Jesus didn't want to avoid the Samaritans. Jesus headed straight to Samaria on what scripture says is a journey he had to go on in order to meet a woman in the middle of her journey. And so we're gonna pick up in the book of John chapter four and we're gonna read in verse one. Scripture says, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. And he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour, which would be about noon that time. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And she said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give shall never thirst again. But the water I will give will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water. That way I won't be thirsty anymore, nor come all the way here to draw. And he said, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have answered correctly. I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain and you people say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and has now and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to you, to her, I who speak to you am he. And the correct translation on that is I who speak to you, I am. You see, 
there were many people who tried to get Jesus to tell them who he was, to declare that, that he was the Christ, that he was the savior. And here we see in this picture with a woman at the well, he says, I who speak to you, I am. The Jews and Samaritans hated each other. In verse four, we read that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Jesus, in going through and to Samaria, went beyond the cultural norm. In fact, he shattered the cultural norm because the cultural norm did not serve kingdom purposes. And throughout this encounter, we see the importance that Jesus places on kingdom process. His journey was spiritually necessary. He had a course that was marked out to meet with this woman. And in your life and in mine, the Lord has a course marked out. He has a course marked out whereby he wants us to understand the importance of those who we would come into contact with. Jesus understood the importance of this woman who he would come in contact with on his journey to Galilee. So much so, he didn't give himself the option to go around Samaria. Rather, he had to go to Samaria. It was necessary. It was a necessary journey. And in his necessary journey, he would bring a perspective to her life beyond failure, beyond guilt. And he would point her to the state of her soul and to the state of her heart. 1 Timothy 1, 15 to 16 reads, It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost of all, yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Jesus Christ demonstrates his perfect patience as an example in our lives so that we can be an example in the lives of others. Each day, there are places that we must go. And within these places that we must go, there are people who need to know Jesus. There are people who he doesn't know, but the Lord wants to know. And when we understand and when we take a hold of his purpose for us as Christ followers, we begin to understand what is truly necessary for our day. His purpose is not simply to fulfill our to-do list, but a fulfillment of the call to share the gospel of Christ, to share what he has done in our hearts, to share what he has done in our lives. Jesus models this by plotting a course to his journey that included this appointment with the woman at the well. There are places that others may not go. There are places that others wouldn't go in Jesus' time. They would avoid it because of cultural reasons. And in these places that that others may not go, it's important for us to understand Christ's heart for those who reside in these places that others may not go. There was great tension that existed between the Samaritans and the Jews. And in 722 BC, the Northern Kingdom of Israel was destroyed by the Assyrian people. And and many of the Jewish people were deported to a far off place. And once the Jewish people were taken away, the Assyrians sent some of their people to Israel where they intermarried with some of the remaining Jews. What resulted was the Samaritan people who were were Jewish and and, and Assyrian, and the Jews looked at them as these people who, who could not go and worship in Jerusalem. They considered them outside of the, pro- of the promise. They considered them unclean. They considered them a people to avoid at all costs. That's who these Samaritans become. The Jewish people despised them. They were culturally secluded and avoided. They were hated. Jesus When we see him go to Samaria, it's a great lesson for us. It shows us his heart for all people. The need to reach out to all people, looking beyond cultural distinctions to oneness and unity in him. 
Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. Salvation doesn't have a race. Salvation doesn't have a, a gender. Salvation doesn't have a location. We are all one in Christ. And the Lord sends us to those places that others may not seek to go, into situations that others would rather avoid. Why? Because he uses his people to show others the way. The necessary journey then becomes making a difference in the places that you would go, in the places that you have to go. The Lord will use you on that journey when you give his purposes priority. Once in Samaria, Jesus needed rest. Scripture says he was wearied from his journey. We also know that he was hungry and thirsty. How do we know this? Well, we know this because he sent his disciples out to go and get some food. Well, you might be thinking, why didn't he just ask someone for some loaves and fish and, you know, feed the whole gang? One of the interesting things you have to recognize about Jesus is that he didn't do miracles for himself. When he fed the 5,000, that was for others. So he sends his disciples out to go and get some food, just like we normally would do. But he was tired and he was thirsty and he was tired and, 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 and weary. But as this woman comes up, he recognizes his need to talk with her. And sometimes when we go on a, a, a journey where we're seeking some sort of solace or rest, we like to call those vacation. It's easy for us to vacate on vacation. I'm on vacation, man. I can do whatever, right? And, and, and Jesus doesn't vacate on his vacation, so we don't get that excuse. But last year, Kathy and I went on a trip to my mom's house, and it's a long flight, like seven or eight hours. And as we were coming back, I was thinking on this flight, like, I'm going to get some good sleep here. I'm going to get just rested up, like rejuvenated. It's going to be all good. I'm going to kind of just vacate while I'm on this plane. But the Lord had other plans. There were two legs to the flight. One was a shorter leg. One was a longer leg. And we were flying southwest, and so we had Eli, our infant, with us. And so most people were just avoiding trying to sit next to us. And this woman comes, and she sits down next to me. And I was like, ah, you know, great. Yeah, nice to meet you. I'm going to take a nap. No, <laughs> not so. She started talking to me about the Lord, started talking to me about Jesus. We were able to like encourage each other. Actually, she was able to encourage me. I was able to encourage her. It was like this really cool blessing. She a, like a, was a church planter and we began to just share. And it was a real encouragement to me, but also to her. She was really encouraged by this flight. And so we got on the next flight. I'm like, okay, I'll get some rest on this one. It's a long flight. This one's the longer one. And people are coming by, coming by, coming by. And then this young 30s guy sits down. And I'm like, you sure you want to sit? You know, we have, I didn't actually say that. I'm just thinking that in my head. Um, I was kind of hoping that would, you know, sit vacant, that I could vacate. But he sits down and he just starts in with the conversation. And I'm like, I'm not getting a nap on this because this guy needs to know the love of Jesus in his life. And so we just began talking about Jesus and I began talking about his path and where he was at and what he was doing in his life. And he's like, he's like, you know what? I needed to sit next to you on this flight. The Lord had divine appointments and people who he wanted me to sit next to on this flight. I was not able to vacate on my vacation. Jesus also didn't refrain from his opportunity. He understood the spiritual importance of meeting with this woman who was in need of living water. She was in need of Jesus and what he would bring to her life. And he brings those people into our life as well because there are people who need to know. There are people who need to know him. There are people who need to know his heart for them. And this Samaritan woman, she arrived around noon and she was by herself. She came to draw water and she's by herself. And the interesting thing about her showing up at noon was that that was a very, very uncommon time for, for anybody, particularly women, to draw water. 
They didn't come at noon. That was the heat of the day. They would come later, and it was actually like this social part of their day where they would begin to be able to share about their families and talk about what was going on in their day. And they would come and it was like this really great time where women would come together and they would go and they would draw water. But she's there by herself at noon during the middle of the day. And so what can we gather from that? She was an outcast amongst who Jesus called out, or I'm sorry, Jesus didn't call them, uh, who Jews called outcasts. She was alone. They didn't want her around them. They probably thought she was going to try to, you know, take their man or something. Take their husband. First Friday would have got that. You know, take their man, like, you know, their man. All right, now we're tracking, right? Yeah, okay. She, she had five husbands, and they're like, I don't want her. I don't want her getting in to know my family. Like, keep her, go at noon. And so Jesus spoke to her, right in the heat of the day. Jesus spoke to her, and he said, give me a drink. And she then responded, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? A few specifics about this. The first is this. In this time, in this day, particularly for a Jewish male, if they weren't in your family or a servant of yours, you didn't talk to women in public. It's just the way that the times were. The second thing was a Jew, in addition to that, was not to relate to a Samaritan. The third thing is, is under no circumstance was a Jew to eat or drink from any tableware that was handled by a Samaritan. It was, it was in their mind unclean. And so there's, there's all of these cultural rules that had been established that Jesus begins to tear down one by one. And he tears down the cultural rules governing Samaritan, Jew, man, woman. And he tears down these cultural boundaries that governed social interaction. He broke these cultural rules because if this woman was going to hear the truth, if this woman was going to ever find out about living water, who was going to bring it to her? If not him, then who? Tradition and rules that aren't found in scripture can certainly aid in helping us to better serve God. The difficulty is when those traditions and when those rules and when those things that we put in place, that man puts in place, gets in the way of kingdom progress. In those times, we must understand what is being encouraged by God and what is being encouraged by man. And those things that are being encouraged by men, we have to put to the side. There's a scripture in Matthew 15. If you would turn with me there to Matthew 15, we're going to look at that. <clears throat> in Matthew 15, actually, I'm going to start in verse 1. Scripture says, then some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders for which they do not wash their hands when they eat bread? And he answered and said to them, why do you yourselves transgress in the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father or mother. And by this, you invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Some, some, some history of what's going on is very important to understand in what Jesus is saying here. So, Jews believed that God received the law on Mount Sinai, that uh, Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. But they later said that the Lord gave further revelation to Moses and it was not written in scripture. It was just passed down verbally, but it wasn't written in scripture. And so they believed that there were these other things. And so what these became is the traditions of the elders. This included washing of hands. It also included um, that if you had something in your house that was of great value, 
it was of great value to you, you could dedicate it to the Lord. And when you dedicated it to the Lord, you could use it for your purposes, but nobody else could use it because it was dedicated to the Lord. And so there were all these great, these things that people greatly valued that they had in their home. And even if someone was in need, even if someone was hurting, even mother or father, they would say, oh, sorry, I have it, but you can't use it because it's dedicated to the Lord. And so Jesus points out, oh, wow, isn't that a convenient way to refuse help to people who are in need? And he says, you have made the commitment of God of no effect by your traditions. You have, you, have, you have made committing something to God of no effect because it's a tradition that man put in place. And it's critical that we put the way of the Lord above the way of man. The things that the word of God pours into our life, the things that God says do. And, and I'm by no means saying, oh, if someone says this would be a good thing for your spiritual journey, there are many things like that. I would be the first to tell you, Spiritual disciplines are great, but let me tell you something. When those get in the way of kingdom progress, we better be careful because the Lord wants us to use everything that we've been given so that we can encourage people in relationship with him. And Jesus says, you have made the commitment of God of no effect because of your traditions. May we never get there it's critical that we do this. And, and we have to keep our heart in the right place before the Lord and towards others that, that people might avoid. His heart is to show the way to those who need to know him, to reveal the heart of the Father. And when he reveals his heart, and when we understand the way, we also understand Isaiah 55, 8, that says his ways are not our ways. And the only way that we're gonna know what his ways are is to seek him is to know what his heart might be for those who we come into contact with on our journey. He points you down a better path. He does this by changing the focus from what is temporary to what will satisfy your soul. Jesus said to the woman, if you knew who it was who was speaking to you, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water that living water represents the Holy Spirit. She points out to Jesus that he has nothing to draw. She's still focused on water, water. She says, do you have some source of water that's greater than what our Lord Jacob gave to us? Are you greater? Are you saying that you're greater than Jacob? You don't even have anything to draw water with and you're saying that you're greater than Jacob? And Jesus responds and says, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But he, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Jesus gives us a path to living water. When Jesus refers to this water, he is pointing to what is temporary. He is pointing to what will satisfy today to what feels good today. This water that will make us thirst again, these possessions. It's like when we go to breakfast and we plan our day based upon our meals, right? You've probably had someone in your life where it's like, okay, we just got done with breakfast. What's for lunch? Now lunch is over. What's for dinner? You're full. Like you're satisfied. Why don't you enjoy the next four hours? And then we'll figure out what's gonna happen then. This is the water, like the stuff that we will just thirst again. Like we know we're gonna have to eat lunch again, right? But, but there's all of these things that we put in place that are just temporary. But we elevate them and we think that those are gonna satisfy. I remember when I was in eighth grade, I was talking to this guy and he said, he, he, said he was buying a computer that was $10,000. Okay, well, that was like 22 years ago. And that computer that he bought, I mean, today, 22 years ago, that was like 22 years ago. And that computer that he bought 22 years ago for 10 grand, I could probably buy at Goodwill. 10 grand, but he thought, he's like, this, is, this thing's gonna change my life. This thing is going to absolutely change my life. But there's all of these things, shoes, clothes, cars, all of this stuff that we feel like will satisfy us. You know, they have these shoes out, they're called big baller brand shoes. 
They're for big ballers. You want to know why they're for big ballers? Because the, the, the entry level price is four ninety five. Four hundred ninety five. And then and then they have like the, the big baller brand plus, which is the next tier, which is nine ninety five for these pair this pair of shoes. And someone said to this guy, because his son's a basketball player, he said, like a former basketball player, you know who Shaquille O'Neal is? Okay, sorry to bore you with sports stuff. I love sports. Okay, so this guy, Shaquille O'Neal, Shaquille O'Neal says to the, the guy who started this brand, he says, hey, big ballers don't charge people $500 for a pair of shoes. And he says, well, we don't want people who aren't big ballers, and big ballers can afford it. And so the, the worst thing about it is that they come out with these shoes, four ninety five, nine ninety five, and on the first day on the market, they sold $150,000 of shoes, right? I gotta have those big baller shoes. May I never wear a pair of big baller shoes. I hope I find them at Goodwill. <laughs> you know what I mean? Jesus refers to this water and it doesn't satisfy and there are many great things to, to have, but many of those things can take a greater priority than what will really renew us, than what will really satisfy our soul. Only God can do this. If we let these things become, uh, take a higher priority in our lives, we become spiritually dry. And we begin, we begin looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places. This woman was thinking of material, physical water, and Jesus is referring to the spiritual, eternal realm. He wants her to understand what will satisfy her thirsty soul rather than what will satisfy for today. Well, I just got to get the job done. I just got to make sure I feel good today. And I'll worry about, you know, I'll worry about that well springing up later. You know, like if, if, you, if you ever work on your home, there's always these decisions. Like when we bought our house, we uh, had to get a lot of different tools because I had pretty much absolutely nothing. And so the first place I went, I, they send out these articles in the newspaper. And if you shop there, hey, you probably had better experience than I did. But the first place I went was this place called Harbor Freight, okay? And I went out to Harbor Freight and I'm like buying all this stuff and I bought this drill and like it smells like it's sm burning. Like this drill's burning. I'm like, I think something's wrong with this uh, drill that I bought at Harbor Freight. So I took it back, got another one. It was burning as well. Uh, we ended up having to go, you know, a few months later and get like a real drill. And so if, if, you, if, if you shop there, I mean, hey, God bless you. <laughs> you can borrow my Harbor Freight drill if you ever need to. But no, here's the deal. Like, I was like, I just got to get the job done. Like, I just got to get it done. This one's like half the price. I'm just going to stick with this one. And it was not a good thing. And sometimes in our lives, we're just looking for a quick fix. Like, I feel this way. I need to get this thing accomplished. And so I'm going to go for what is temporary, what will temporary satisfy, what's going to make this thing, you know, just work today, and then we'll figure it out later. But that's not what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to seek living water in our lives. And this Samaritan woman, she then asked for living water. And it's almost like the, the tone of it in Scripture is almost like a little bit cynical, sarcastic, like, okay, sir, <laughs> where's this living water so that I can no longer be thirsty and, uh, and then I won't have to come all the way out here to this well and draw water. Like, where's this living water? And Jesus points his finger to the place of her greatest need and he says, okay, go call your husband and have him come here. And she says, I have no husband. And then he reveals her error, her sin, the reason why she was there alone. Her life had become difficult and her life had become messy. And she had begun to, to look to these various husbands for satisfaction. She'd begun to look to the way of man for satisfaction and it wasn't satisfying. Her life was difficult and, and, and messy and Jesus wanted to get right to that place whereby she would hear him. That place is in her heart where she would know who he was. There's no conversion without conviction and there's no forgiveness without repentance. And the only way that we can truly do that is if we are exposed in our heart before the Lord. 
If you drink of the well of worldly pleasure, it only ends in death. Hebrews 11, 24 to 25 says, By faith, Moses chose rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy in the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. This comes on the heels of when he says, no, I'm I'm not the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. What Egypt has to offer me is nothing in comparison to what God says that I am. And so whatever I have to endure because of that, that's what I'm going to endure because that's what will satisfy. And as Jesus presses into her heart and the core issue, she tries to get the focus off of herself. Saying this, she responds, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Asking then his thoughts on this great theological debate of the time. She says, our people worship on this mountain, Gerizim. The Jews worship in Jerusalem. What's right? Jesus cuts through all of that. And, and, and when we go and when we go to reach out to others and we talk to them about Jesus and they will bring up this, that, and the other theological debate. Well, what about this? Well, what about that? What do you think about this here? And we have to be very careful about that because what we see Jesus do is point right to the heart of the issue. Sure. He says, we know that salvation is coming through the Jews, but, but that doesn't matter. Why? Because there's an hour that is coming where people won't worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem. People will worship, true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. True worshipers will have living water. And so Jesus gets beyond all of that and invites her in. And he invites us in as well into true worship. True worshipers will be recognized by the way they worship, not where. He made the place and the man-made order of worship secondary and made what, what needed to be primary, primary, which was the heart. True worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. Those who worship this way, the Father seeks. Verse 23 says, the Father seeks those who worship this way. Doesn't that blow your mind? I feel so, you know, there are times I feel so distant. I feel so distant, like, I just feel like God's distant. This, This verse here, 23, John 4, 23, the Father seeks those who worship him. The Father seeks them. Just just like he comes after this woman here, the father seeks them right on their journey. This expression in spirit refers to the human spirit, the immaterial inner being within each person. The spirit that was once dead and by the grace and sacrifice of Christ was brought back to life. The spirit that we have in us and worship involves a a, a person's awareness that that spring of eternal life, that spring of living water comes from the restorer of our soul. He's the one who has given us life and he's the one who has given us the opportunity to worship anywhere we would like. Your body can be anywhere Worship takes place as your attention and your focus is taken off of what is this? Off of your left, off of your right, off of your day, and you point it towards our eternal Father. And we point our attention towards God with our whole heart, the inner man. In truth means to worship in a true way or with genuineness. We worship recognizing God's character and nature as well as our common need for him. We worship in truth because we worship what is true. And that is our Lord. 
in contrast to worshiping in spirit and in truth is fleshly or false worship. This is blindly worshiping out of habit with no heartfelt devotion. And let me tell you something, when we come into the place of worship, and I have to do this even as a worship leader, I have to say, Lord, I wanna be in the place that you want me to be. I want to be there. I don't want to just do business as usual. And when we come in on Sunday mornings or we have nights of worship, I don't want it to just be business as usual. Oh, you know, yeah, we'll do a couple songs. We'll get through those. It's not just a box to check. No, God desires us to worship him in spirit and in truth with our heart. And that can be the most difficult thing but when we understand his heart for us, you see, we don't like to be told that the way we do something is wrong. <laughs> That's really hard these days to say to someone, hey, no, you're wrong. And Jesus says that to this woman here. He says, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. Let me tell you how true worshipers worship. And if, and if we would take the time and if we would seek to understand how our Lord wants to be approached in worship, he will seek us in that place and he will find us in that place and we will seek him with our whole heart and we will know him and it will be beautiful. Isaiah 29, 13 says, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. Oh Lord, may it never be that we would come near to you with our mouth, but far from you with our heart. One of my older sisters is a, a worship leader and she's um, done a few records and so she's been able to travel uh, throughout the country in various places and sing with really prominent Christian artists and one time she was singing in a concert with this prominent Christian artist and they got done with the worship concert and they went backstage and she said to him you could do this in your sleep and what she meant by that was a compliment of how well he did and he stopped her right there and he said you know what that's the scariest thing to just do something out of tradition to do something out of the talent of man with no heart and just walk through it in our sleep and some of us we're living this life and we're walking as Christians and we're trying to pursue God and some of us are trying to do this with our whole heart and others of us are doing this in our sleep and God is saying, wake up and seek me in spirit and seek me in truth and follow me and know that there's a world out there that's waiting for you to change it. And I will be with you when you go. And I will walk with you when you go. And we will go and we will make disciples and we will baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they will come into new life. And they too will be able to come in and worship in spirit and truth. But if we invite people in here and they don't see a church where we're worshiping with our whole heart in spirit and truth, they're going to think they're just sleeping through it. Let us not be that. Let us be anything but that. Let us be sincere before the Lord. And I'm not trying to say that that means when people come in here, they need to see us, you know, running around and doing the Macarena. I am not saying that. I'm just saying heartfelt devotion. How do you know what heartfelt devotion is? You know it when you see it. You know the way that, that I am. You know the way I lead worship. I don't jump and go. I mean, sometimes I do, okay. Sometimes I do, okay. But, but that's not like my, my thing, you know? Why? Because my thing is, God, where do you want me to be this morning? What do you have in store for, for me and for this body of people? And let us do it sincerely. And may people know it when they see it and when they see this place as a place whereby we worship in spirit and we worship in truth and we worship our creator and we know people will come into here and they will say that's a place where people worship. Oh, let it be so, Lord. May we not do this in our sleep. May we not walk this out in our sleep. May we not go on this journey in our sleep and focus on the wrong things, no. Let's be alive. We serve a living God who gives us fresh and living water. 
It's not stagnant. It's not in some cistern. It's not in some well. No, he's a living God. And he works in us and he works through us. And he wants to be what will renew us. Not trying to find renewal in some water out of some well or renewal in some possession. Renewal in anything other than our true and living God. And when we do that, he will renew our strength. The Lord has a necessary journey and he wants to meet you in the place where you're at. He wants to meet you in your place of greatest need. He wants to meet you in the place where you say, I've failed and I've failed miserably and I continue to fail. And God wants to say, hey, you give me a drink of water. And we're gonna talk about living water. And we're gonna talk about what it looks like to have the Holy Spirit in your life, moving in you and moving through you. And we're gonna talk about what that looks like when you go to work. And we're gonna talk about what that looks like when you go to the grocery store. I didn't share this with first service, but a few weeks ago, there were actually two people from this church who are in this room right now. When I went to the DMV, I ran into them and I was at the DMV and I was out front of the DMV. I didn't even plan to share this story with you this morning, but I'm out front in the DMV and I was actually listening to uh, a script, uh, uh, a Bible message on my phone. And I was just out front, you know, enjoying the beautiful day. And as this guy walks out the front door, I see this guy walk out the front door and he's with his son. And I have a son and this guy's obviously, you know, further along in his life than I am. And I felt impressed upon my heart. Tell him about me. And as this man walks towards me, he's with his son and, and his son's obviously going to get his uh, driver's license. And so his son goes around to the corner. This man comes back and he sits down on the steps and I didn't want to talk to him. For a couple of reasons. Number one, on his hand were the words, was the word hell. He had tattoos uh, and there's nothing wrong. With, I'm not saying, trying to say there's anything wrong, wrong with tattoos, but there were tattoos that indicated like gang involvement and time in prison and, and, and things like this. I mean, all over his body. And I'm sitting there going, I just want to leave. Like, I don't, I don't want, I mean, I, I'm like, Lord, you see his hand? Do you know what's on his hand? It was overwhelming. Like, I got to talk to this person. So he's over there and he's sitting down. And um, then he went into the DMV. And I was like, okay, well, there you go. He's got business to do. And he came back out. <laughs> I'm like, okay, here we go. I said, hey, is your son getting his license today? And he said, yeah. I said, man, that's so cool. I have a, a one-year-old son. And um, I know it's going to be not too long before he's there. And so I'm trying to enjoy each day um, as much as possible. And he said, yeah, enjoy it. It goes fast. And we just began talking, just began to have conversation with him. And I knew that the reason why I was talking to him was so I could share Jesus with him. And I'm not trying to tell you the story because like I'm doing something. But, but when he came back out, what came into my mind was Samuel, if not you, you're a pastor, who? And if not us Christian, then who? And so I begin to talk to him and, and begin to find out about his life. And he had just gotten out of prison, 17 years served in prison while you know, he was basically in, in incarcerated while his children grew up and he's trying to make up for lost times. And we begin to talk about his life. And I begin to say, hey, you know, it's really interesting because I work with a lot of people who are going through exactly what you're going through. And I'm a pastor at a local church. And he said, really? I said, yes. He goes, that's amazing because I've been looking for a church to go to. I said, man, we're right over Washington Square, um, right by Washington Square. Come, please. I said, I, 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 um, I would love to have you. I, I would love for you to come. I'd love to hear your story. I'd love to get coffee with you. I'd love to figure this out. And he said, you know what? In my darkest hour, God spoke to me. And he said, I, I, I just want to say something to you. I mean, we talked for a while. And he said at the end, he said, I just want to say something to you. He said, um, this is from his mouth. Thank you for listening to God and talking to me. I said, man, it's the 
privilege of my life to be able to talk to you about Jesus. He's got a plan for you, sir. And I'm excited to see it. And we exchange numbers and we text each other. And, and he hasn't come out here, but I hope you all get to meet him. It's going to be beautiful. But here's the thing. It's not about me. It's just about me being willing. And we just have to be willing to know that God wants to use us and that there are people who are waiting who will say, thank you for listening. Thank you for talking to me. Psalm 63, one to four, you God are my God, earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and behold your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. 